So let me welcome everybody on behalf of Tourism Review. Uh, and the, this is the second Tourism Review webinar that we're doing. And we are focusing more uh, towards uh, the West, uh, the United States and the Americas. And that's uh, why we're doing that at the, at the US friendly time, while in Europe, it's quite late in the evening. Um, the opportunity that we have here is to discuss some big ideas because we really like to attract more papers uh, for the tourism review that they're looking to the big ideas and they are they are uh, um, uh, examining some of the very big issues that we've got in uh, society that tourism can actually play a role and have an impact. So um, I would like to uh, thank our speakers. Uh, Pauline S and Pauline M and then uh, Brian and Eduardo and uh, I'll give the floor to Tete and to Daisy who are uh, going to introduce the webinar and then they'll introduce uh, the speakers accordingly. Thank you and welcome. Thank you all for coming to this webinar. So uh, just a hint for the webinar. Uh, when the uh, when the panelists are presenting, uh, please do not interrupt. If you have any questions, please type it in the chat. At the end, we do have about 30 minutes to or 40 minutes to go over your questions. At that time, if you want to ask your questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, so just during the presentation, please to be respectful. So type your uh, questions in the chat, please. As we all know that COVID has accelerated um, some of the technology acceptance, uh, which also has tremendous impact on the tourism industry. Now, as the pandemic is fading out, uh, the um, par paradigm shifts in consumers' behavior larger space. So therefore, we have to rethink the concept of innovation in this new era and to explore how innovation could help the tourism industry to adapt to the new normal post-pandemic and shape the future of tourism with competitive advantage. To this end, Tourism Review is developing a special issue on the topic of reshaping future tourism through innovation. You may scan the QR code on the slide to see the details of CFP for this special issue. Um, so me, Eduardo, and uh, uh, Peter, and also Gary will be the guest editor for this special issue. Um, this um, platform, submission platform is now open and the deadline for the submission, for the full paper submission is May 31st, 2023. So I hope today's webinar will give you some idea um, for you to conduct some research on this innovation in tourism and submit your paper to tourism review special issue. So thank you. And now I'm going to pass the ground to Daisy, who will introduce us with our um, prestigious panelists. Thank you, Cece. Um, yeah, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this uh, uh, webinar. Um, today's agenda is like each of our distinguished speaker will have a, a roughly 15 minutes of the talk. Uh, after this, we will have a Q&A section and it's also like a panel discussion and then we can pick up any questions from the uh, the chat box, if any. Um, so, okay, first, if it's uh, all right, I will uh, invite Professor Pauline Sheldon first. But before that, I will give a very brief introduction of Pauline Shelton, but I'm sure uh, this is not really necessary for most of you. But anyway, I will have this uh, short bios. Um, so Professor uh, Pauline Sheldon is Professor Amerta, University of uh, Hawaii School of Travel Industry Management, where she also serves as Dean. She had published widely in the area of tourism demand modeling, information technology and tourism and tourism education. Her seven books include Wellness Tourism, Mind, Body, Spirit, Place, and Social Entrepreneurship in Tourism, Practices, Principles, and the Philosophies. 
Her current research includes regenerative and transformative tourism. She has worked with international organizations such as UNWTO and the World Bank, was the first woman president of the International Academy for the Study of Tourism, and co-founded the Tourism Education Futures Initiative and Trinite. She currently serves on the advisory board of the Hawaii Green Girls. So Professor Shelton, please. Thank you, Chi Chi. Uh, that was way too long an introduction, but it's a pleasure to be here today with you all. Thank you, Demetrius, Chi Chi, and da Daisy for putting this together. I think the more that we can put our heads together to think about the future is absolutely critical at this point in time. So <clears throat> the, the approach I'd like to take, oh, by the way, you said 15 minutes, CC. I thought we had 10, so I'm gonna be able to sort of go a little more slowly, but please time me if you see me going over, okay, Chi Chi? Thank you. Okay, so um, the approach I thought I'd, I'd take in, in discussing sort of innovation into the future is, is the one of uh, the regenerative approach. Um, <clears throat> together with my colleague, uh, Irena Ateljevic in um, Croatia, we put together a journal, a special issue of the Journal of Tourism Futures on this topic. And so any of you who wanna read more, uh, you can find it there. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so <clears throat> as we start this rethink, based on what the pandemic put us through. Uh, many, many philosophers and many economists and thinkers have, have sort of given their two cents worth. But the one I find the most um, uh, stimulating is Arundhati Roy's comment. And she said, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal between one world and the next. We can walk through it dragging the carcasses of our avarice dead deeds behind us, or we can walk lightly through with little luggage ready to imagine another world. So I really like this because she challenges us to see how we can go forward differently and what luggage we might want to drop. We're in the travel industry, right? So what is the baggage? What is the luggage? that we should drop to reimagine another world with tourism in it. So next slide, please. So <clears throat> as I look at it, what it is we have to drop, the luggage we have to drop is the economic system that most of our industry or most of tourism has been built on over the last few decades. And that's the neoliberal economic system. There are many, many authors, uh, I've cited a couple there who've written on this, um, there is a whole new um, thread of new economic thought that really puts to bed the ideas of uh, neoliberalism, where self-interest drives ideal human behavior, uh, consumption is encouraged for its own sake, um, <clears throat> the idea that only competition can lead to economic progress, we know that collaboration is very important also, um, the idea that more income equals more happiness. Well, we know to a certain degree it does, but beyond that certain um, level of satisfaction, uh, anyway, beyond that level of income, it does not. And then, oh, hang on. And then uh, lastly, and I think the one I want to focus on most is that the economic system upon which tourism has essentially been built ignores mostly human values. So <clears throat> what we have to do then is, I think, start looking at what it is we value, what are the resources we value in destinations so that we can start uh, putting them together in different ways. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> there are many different ways that we can break away from the uh, neoliberal economic system. The collaborative economy has been written about a lot. Diane Dredge has done a great book on this, on tourism, uh, collaborative economy. Uh, the economy of creativity, where knowledge and um, intelligence and, and uh, uh, creativity are valued. Greg Richards has uh, done a lot of work in this area. Uh, the circular economy. Uh, focusing on the recycling of our physical resources, and Zhu et al. have a great paper on that. Very interesting one on the sacred economy, where we start valuing what's common to humanity and the various traditions and cultures of destinations. Charles Eisenstein, uh, great work there. 
Uh, the economy of, of generosity, or, or, or the gift economy, again, this one has been around for a while, but is starting to get a lot more discussion in tourism. Sebastian Philippe at Hong Kong is doing some great work on, on this. And of course, the regenerative economy, which Anna Pollock has uh, done great work on. So <clears throat> all of these different uh, economic structures place a lot of value on other capitals other than financial capital. Financial capital will always be there, but the other capitals, whether it's trust capital, social capital, uh, so on and so forth, are brought into the equation. So <clears throat> just a few comments on the regenerative economy, and then I'll start talking about how um, in, in Hawaii, we've started to build on some of these uh, ideas. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> regenerative tourism, as we know, is, is one that attempts to replenish and revitalize long-term flourishing in destinations, flourishing of the communities and the ecosystems. And to get inspiration of how to design regenerative tourism, it's important that we look to living systems, because therein lies the wisdom and people's very often the indigenous people who live close to the land and close to the living systems, they, they have the value sets that can move us forward. The other recognition I think that's very important is that we, we really are on a journey. Regenerative tourism takes a substantial amount of in-depth questioning and conversations. Uh, uh, and it's not like we're getting to a destination of regenerative tourism at the end of this year or the end of this month. It's an ongoing system that has to be institutionalized in the destination so that conversations continue. But most importantly, it requires a new mindset, I think, of all of the stakeholders. And therein is the challenge and the rub uh, in order to really make this, this, this happen. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so this, I, you all know this idea, you know, looking at tourism more as, as a system rather than separate, because I think sometimes we make decisions as a, as a siloed industry, and that's not always in the... Okay, um, next slide, please. So changing the values. Um, this is something that we are <clears throat> working on in Hawaii uh, in a big way, um, trying to shift how we are bringing values into decision-making and moving the destination forward. We're doing a lot of consultation with communities through a process called DMAPS, Destination Management Action Plans. Yeah. The community is able to express how it wants uh, uh, tourism to go forward and trying to move into some of these other value shifts as well. Uh, looking at uh, generosity over greed, most importantly, stakeholder well-being over stockholder profit. Um, that, I think, is, is the crux of how we're going to innovate in the future in a way that's value-driven. Um, very, very important. And I think a whole discussion and debate in regenerative tourism is, is what does it mean for us to be successful in tourism? Looking at different metrics, uh, maybe even suspending metrics and then continuing with discussions, uh, redefining and getting the input on what success uh, really means. Okay, next slide, please. Um, I've given some thought to, you know, what would it look like if we, if we design tourism for, for creativity, you know, looking at the creative economy, what is it we have to innovate in, in order to, to, to move in this direction? Because I think this is where the richness lies. Uh, tourism is a people-based uh, phenomenon, and it's the people that hold the creativity. So if we start looking at the degree to which, you know, innovation, diversity, imagination, inspiration can be brought through into the destination, uh, that right direction. Um, I think the real richness is so, um, I was talking about social entrepreneurs, and, and I see these really as the key element in destinations to start as innovating, moving towards regenerative models uh, of tourism, because they hold not only the profit incentive that we know is uh, always going to be there for tourism enterprises, but they hold the value set and the desire to contribute to the destination in, in many, many ways. And I, I did publish a book with Roberto Daniele on this topic. In Hawaii, we are looking at these um, very important nodes of our, of our industry and putting grants out, 
trying to support the development of social entrepreneurial activity, particularly from the indigenous Hawaii people. Um, they hold so much of the culture and the knowledge, and they are you know, doing some beautiful work, designing some very, very interesting uh, enterprises. So that's a big piece, I think, in innovation moving forward. Um, also, you know, looking at how we can design experiences in destinations so that um, uh, tourists can can have uh, a, a creative experiences is, is a really, really big part of this. You know, not having them go through the typical experience, but uh, engaging creativity uh, once they're at the destination. Um, a big part of this also that we're working with is, is redefining um, tourism work and trying to build a cadre of tourism change makers. Um, people who are not just slotting into the corporate world as they graduate from uh, universities and, and going down that track, but um, trying to stimulate change makers uh, to do things differently because I think the, the potential uh, of uh, our human uh, capital is underutilized in tourism and there's so many, so many ways that we can um, do that. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, the other question I ask myself often is, is what would tourism look like if we, again, we did another value shift? And instead of looking at the greed and the corporate way of um, operating, is building uh, an economy of generosity. And there are so many interesting um, examples and studies that have been done on this. Um, it's very interesting when you look at both neuroscience and social science, um, they both point to an incredible benefit uh, if we engage in generous activities versus greedy activities. The whole uh, chemistry of our system uh, is much healthier, uh, as is our sense of well-being and longevity. So there's a whole you know, lecture to be given on greed versus generosity. But if we tilt ourselves towards generosity and away from greed, there are some fascinating ways travel and tourism can innovate. Um, Great TED Talk, uh, any of you who uh, like TED Talks, by Nippon Mehta called Designing for Generosity. Fantastic examples. Uh, in, in tourism, there are some really interesting ones. Um, there's a hotel in Siem Reap that uh, when you check into the hotel room, at least it used to be like this, I think they're still doing it, there is a generosity menu on the table. Uh, rather than having a menu of what burgers or drinks you want, uh, they have a listing of um, how you can contribute to the local economy, $10 and buy a bicycle for the local family, uh, $50 and buy some animals for the farm, uh, $1,000 and buy a new home for uh, the, the community. Of course, it's in a, in a low socioeconomic areas, so the money goes a long way, but these have been phenomenally successful. And as a result, that hotel has the highest, not only the highest occupancy rate, but also the most incredible repeat business because these visitors who contribute and go and meet these families, they want to come back. So it's just one beautiful example of how generosity pays back in so many different ways. Um, <clears throat> in Amsterdam, some of you may know the Untourist Guide, where they have designed experience um, mostly free where the tourists can go and uh, instead of you know just doing uh, commercial activities they can go and fish for plastic in the canals and many many other kinds of things um, there's a restaurant chain in all of the major cities of the world called Karma Kitchen. And um, they have been really, really successful. Um, when you go and eat at the Karma Kitchen restaurants uh, the bill is zero and you're asked to pay it forward to the next people that come. And the people who work there are volunteers. Fascinating model that has been successful. And tour operators are doing it also uh, and generating generosity uh, by people in the destination. Okay, uh, last slide, I think we are on now. <clears throat> next slide. Okay, I'm gonna end um, with uh, a reflection that was stimulated by Freya uh, higgins Debol is on um, Trinet a few months ago. I don't know if any of you are on Trinet or saw this debate, but um, she was proposing that we really 
need to go beyond rethinking, reimagining, and reinventing and focus on disrupting in a positive way. It's interesting we had negative disruptions here today, but in a positive way, disrupting the way that we have been doing business, um, looking at how we can um, um, really build this, this idea of, of, of innovation into our educational programs. Um, I didn't talk about it, but the Tourism Education Futures Initiative, TEFI, focuses on this, but really looking at ways to um, shake loose a new way of, of doing tourism that is beyond what we're doing. Certainly, we can do incremental changes, absolutely. Um, incremental innovations are always good, but this value shift and this disruption in a positive way, I think, is something as educators and scholars in tourism, we need to give some thought to. So at that, I will leave it. I don't know how long I spoke for. I hope that was okay. And I'll hand it back to Chi Chi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pauline. Okay, back to Tete and to Daisy. Daisy is introducing uh, the next speaker. Yes, okay. Uh, good. Thanks, Pauline, first. And our very next speaker is Eduardo. So Eduardo Parra Lopez is an experienced scholar and associate professor with a demonstrated history of working in the higher education industry for 25 years. Skilled in Web 2.0, marketing strategy, tourism management, tourism and social media. He is a strong operation professional with a doctor focused on uh, business studies and tourism from University of La Laguna. He has been the ex-president of the Spanish Association of Scientific Experts in Tourism, uh, external advisor to the Central America Tourism Agency as training coordinator and uh, visiting professor at several Latin American universities. He is now the co-editor of the Journal of Destination Marketing and Management and also the associate editor of Tourism Review. So welcome, Adiado. Hello, <clears throat> hello, uh, Daisy, and hello, everybody, and thank you, um, uh, Dimitrius, uh, to invite, to invite, uh, you know, to, to share you know, my my experience and my my ideas about uh, how we do in the future in terms of uh, differencing in a destination. Behind me, we have an, a human, a human. Probably all of you can look my picture. That's an, a human. So I'm going to talk about the human innovation, okay? So my experience uh, also, you know, the, in an island during uh, during the pandemic, because of most of the hoteliers and most of the businessmen, you know, phone me and call me, okay, Eduardo, what we can do with the, this situation? So discussing with them, we start to think about what is happening, you know, with inside, you know, the tourism around the world, um, my spirit in different things. So we start to move in a chaotic, uh, moving in a chaotic world in terms of the different scenario. So we need to change what uh, we change the mind that we we need to, to put in, in the middle of the, the, the tourism in terms of the great inter interdependence and uh, interconnected interconnectedness um probably uh, we need to 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 the to define a new scenario for differencing uh, with the the chaos that we we are moving now so we, we need to continue uh, uh, analyzing the different things and we need to quick decision in terms of uh, we need the differencing for the the tourism change the slide so we start about, I don't agree with uh, Pauline in different things in terms of the human. We need to put the person in the middle of the, the tourism now. That's why we are. We need to, to, to talk about the human innovation. Probably uh, when I start to analyze, I'm going to share with the different, co different colleagues. Okay, we need to, to, to put in uh, what is happening with the different thing about the human innovation. So I start to, to find and to, to, to analyze the different, uh, you know, papers, uh, journals, and uh, I'm fine uh, at complex theory uh, about the, 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 the different things inside the problem. Probably we need a different problem in terms of simplicity. We, we have different problems in terms of uh, organized complicity. And, 
Now we are in a disorganized complexity problem. So we need to work together in terms of we have a tourism, but that tourism is a phenomenon we need for deep analyt uh, analytic analysis. Change the, the slide, please. So this uh, uh, theory uh, talk about the necessity to have a new tourism organization in terms of a knowledge, in terms to put the person in the middle, personal level. We need to analyze the social level and we need to analyze the institutional level. What is happening with the governance and different destinations? So we need to rethinking what is the, the, the situation now and probably we need to put another thing in terms of that. For me, that is the, uh, the beginning of the, the human innovation to put this theory in the middle of the different things. And we need to you know, go ahead, you know, working together with, uh, with the theory chain, the slide. Chain, okay. So human innovation is the necessity to have a collective, uh, collective intelligence in terms uh, uh, to exchange different ideas and to work uh, together, all together. Uh, Pauline talked about that and the necessity to have cooperating in different things. This seminar uh, webinar is necessary to discuss and to share information with a colleague. That's why it's necessary. So that is the future that we work together, collective intelligence. Change the slide. Okay. Talking with my mom, my mom is professor in biology. So one of the things that she shared with me is uh, thinking in terms of and. So uh, the tourism is quite similar about that. So it's necessary to have the capacity for collective behavior within the tourism system that allow us to decentralize, you know, and self-organize naturally and artificially. So swarm tourism intelligent in that. So it's necessary to have to work like, you know, the, the different ants and the structure of them. Change the slide. And also, Collective intelligent tourism, a necessity of to have a, a structure of cell organization in terms of, for example, observation of and data, to have a model of different prediction, analyze the interpretation of different themes. Pauline showed us on a slide talking about the same, okay, creative and innovation, and also memory and uh, what works. So my, my idea is we must to analyze the human uh, and the human innovation like a human bottom-up approach in the management of tourism, maximum collaboration between all of us in terms of to have an ecosystem of people having the technology as a medium, and also interconnectivities between tourism and organization and people, the people in the middle always, okay? Change slide. Also, uh, the human innovation need to have uh, a combined human leadership and uh, participant style between the customer. So we need to analyze the customer adaptation in this new area of tourism to have an, a continuous improvement inside the structure of the destination, to have uh, collaborate high performance teams. One of the things that we all of the professors that in different universities around the world is to try to input in our you know teaching you know people person uh, collaborating with different things thinking about uh, the person and the students and also giving them early and continuous delivery of value so we have to put different value in terms of working as individual within a colony so human that's the the one i want to share more things. Uh, human smart behavior should, should allow us to interact locally in tourism, uh, flexibility with the adaptation and to new change, so security and people, always the people in the middle. We have to balance a system with human responsibility moving towards more functional elements. And also uh, we have to, to have the tourism need more social behavior in terms not centralized, you know, all of the control structure, uh, how to be half a more degree of random work. So if you look the slide on the right, you have the model 
discussing with different colleagues, different parts of the world. Also, that is the responsibility for sustainable tourism with my colleague of Latin America and different countries in, in, in uh, different you know, communities in, in Spain. So they are always talking about the necessity to have a common goods, collaboration, coherence, emotional, hierarchy, diversity, dialogue, confidence, and learning. So that's the, the, the model that we must to put go ahead in different you know, human innovation. Ch change the slide. And to close uh, uh, and my idea, and that's uh, I want to stay here and I want to share with you that is the research that we are doing here in the Canaries uh, inside our Institute of uh, Tourism and Social Research, that, uh, where we are discussing the open innovation model with emphasis in human potential. We declare you know, this model uh, that the human innovation model in turn to have, you know, different things and different structures. So I want to share with you, Dimitrius, I want to share with the community and give me, uh, give me back information if you are, you know, um, uh, agree with me in turn that is the, 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 the model that we want, we want to improve in different, you know, destination in turn to have the, uh, the human, you know, the person in the middle. Okay. So we want to, to have you know different structure, different scene, and the innovation will we will be you know successful in terms of we have all of the structure very you know all of the connected all of the things. To close, wait, 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 wait. to close, I want to share also uh, on the top of this slide. We want to invite all of you the possibility to have to be well, to be, to stay here in Tenerife next year because we are going to discuss again after uh, 2004 in Glasgow, but uh, we want to invite you to come to Tenerife in 2024, because we are going to discuss the state of their third edition. So I was talking with Tom Baum, the possibility to, to move uh, the, the state of their from Glasgow to Tenerife. So he said, yes. So you are invited to come to Tenerife because we are going to discuss the state of their third edition. So the idea is to follow this webinar, Dimitrios, uh, in Tenerife, discussing different things. So that's why we invite you to come the next year in June to discuss the future of tourism, the state of there. Thank you. That, that is fantastic, Eduardo. And uh, Tourism Review will be supporting the Tourism State of the Art uh, version 3 in Tenerife. Uh, fantastic. Well I done. Very to... interesting. Very interesting things on the innovation and how human is going to drive a whole range of things, and that relates very, very much closely to what Pauline was saying earlier on. So let's bring Pauline uh, Milgood into the discussion. Daisy. Yes. Yeah, so before her speech, uh, let me briefly introduce Pauline. So Dr. Uh, Pauline Millwood is a 2011 Fulbright Scholar and a graduate of uh, Temple University. She received her BSc and Executive MBA from the UWI Jamaica and has 25 years experiences in Jamaica's hospitality sector. Her research focuses on system perspectives of entrepreneurship and innovation and DMO performance. She has presented at several conferences and is the recipient of the Best Paper Award for ADM 2014. At Penn State Book, she teaches entrepreneurship and innovation, revenue and the profit organization, strategic management, and serves on the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. She is a member of the Board of Directors for Pennsylvania Amer uh, Americana DMO. So uh, Pauline, welcome. Thank you, uh, Daisy, and, and thank you, Dimitrios and Chiji, for just the opportunity to share thoughts uh, today. Uh, today, I, as this slide suggests, I am going to be sharing futuristic perspectives and, and really questions uh, that uh, have surfaced in my mind concerning the destination and DMO. 
uh, innovation and, and looking towards the future. And, and by systems perspectives, uh, what I'm doing is perhaps giving equal privilege to, to micro and macro and meso level views uh, of, of innovations as it relates to destination, tourism destinations and DMOs and, uh, and, and the, the, the beautiful chaos, right? That, that happens in between each of those layers. Next slide, please. So everything, everywhere, all at once should perhaps uh, be familiar to some to some persons, and I, I hope I will not spoil it for for some. But as I wrestled with the thought of future innovations and destinations and 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 DMOs, this is really how I felt. Uh, not only is this film having a moment now with the many accolades, certainly, and and. Uh, you know, it's 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 we imagine this Chinese American entrepreneur uh, Evelyn, who is multiverse jumping as it as it were, trying to solve several problems. And uh, I felt that the absurd and complex feelings of 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 watching a film like this really depict um, some of the the questions that uh, we we want to think about as we wrestle with uh, innovation and um, jumping across multiverses as it would be. Yes, I, I am led to, to talk and share with you about three primary questions and, and perspectives today. The first one being this notion of the destination as a boundary object and specifically is it time for us to engage in a more fluid conceptualization of the tourism de uh, destination? Uh, Maxwell from uh, York University, Dr. Maxwell and I uh, did a paper a couple of years ago um, where, where we talked about the destination and, and the use of boundary objects. So boundary objects theory in a nutshell really allows this type of interp interpretive flexibility. It allows for a very fluid understanding of uh, an, a phenomenon and really it helps to, to cement uh, the understanding between communities that normally would not have been there. So as it is applied to the destination, boundary objects theory, as I'm suggesting here, could allow for us to really have a very loose and fluid way in which we both define and understand the tourism destination. What this means is that where the understanding of, of one stakeholder ends, so to speak, an understanding of the phenomenon of my role in the destination, that is where another user's understanding of the, the destination begins. And I'll use the very practical example that we're seeing here, um, where there is a, a duality of roles, so to speak. We, we often refer to destination stakeholders uh, hosts and guests, but we've been seeing that the, the lines are being blurred, where local citizens are, are hosts, yes, they are engaging in the sharing economy, and at the same time, local citizens, residents, uh, can suddenly become vendors. They, they can also become tourists themselves, as we saw within the pandemic, uh, the, the rise of domestic tourism, RV and day trippers and, and staycationers. So, the way in which we traditionally describe the destination, having these almost exclusive elements and actions and actors and, and the, the behavior that made them up, is it, is it time for us to, to blur some of those limits that traditionally have been spatial or temporal and, and assigning exclusive titles and, and think more of a, a way in which a fluid destination system could account for and explain how innovation takes place with respect to tourism products and services, et cetera. So, so the question here, I, I think, um, is, you know, even looking at the example that's on the screen, Clotaire and his colleagues, uh, this was a cidery route in Canada, in Quebec, and, and there were physical boundary restrictions. There were zoning restrictions that prevented signage, et cetera, from being posted. And it, it what it did was to prevent visitors from really engaging with the local cidery owners as they would have liked. And the solution was a geolocated app, a geolocation app that was introduced. And what that did, it satisfied the municipal authorities who did not want to have the traditional signage on the routes because it was not a part of the cultural image. And it also allowed the guests to partake of the destination, not just the 
physical concrete destination, but also the virtual destination. So again, we're seeing the lines being blurred between the, the, the concrete and the physical. I think the term that is being used is, is digital. And so the question then is, in order to conceptualize the future of innovation processes, uh, do we need to apply more fluid theories in understanding the destination? Next slide, please. The second question has to do with the hybridization uh, of DMOs. And whilst there is little doubt that DMOs have evolved and, and continue to evolve in the post-pandemic era, we have, we have previously characterized the DMO as an orchestrator, a hub entity set central to innovation processes, not necessarily because DMOs control resources, um, or own resources, but because of their reputational influence in the collaborative innovation process. And so given the current roles of DMOs with respect to uh, tourism development, with respect to uh, marketing, which is a, a, a major thrust, a major uh, uh, goal for DMOs, what does the future role of the DMO look like if we are to understand that the environment of artificial intelligent influences, VR, AR, and, and the technology-mediated environment that is, is now heavy upon us, that this now must become a part of curating experiences. Uh, DMOs that traditionally prepared travel guides like the one you see for uh, Pennsylvania Americana in my end of the woods. Um, now we, we could perhaps get chat GPT to undertake um, very attractive uh, chat spaces, online spaces, and, and be a part of, of user-generated content. And so the question here, again, and it's a perspective, but it's really more a question, is uh, how will the future DMO look? And will hybridization of the DMO, in other words, this amalgam of what their traditional role is, their current role is, and their future roles will perhaps need to be in light of technology innovations, will we need to see a kind of hybrid model for the DMO. And, uh, you know, I'll just share, uh, last year I spoke with uh, DMO executives and it, it, was, it was remarkable to hear them share both within the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, the influence that they had. You know, what, what, what mesmerized one DMO in particular was that, you know, they said, Pauline, they were calling us when it was time to reopen post pandemic. They were taking their cues from us. So we were taking on a more centralized role compared to the local municipalities and local health authorities and, and even the government and local government. Uh, so, so again, the question becomes, uh, how will we conceptualize the role of the DMO in the innovation process? Uh, even, look, even using the sharing economy as another example before I move on. Another um, DMO uh, president said that they have a, 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 um, an initiative in which they are significantly trying to have a special membership extension to local residents who are Airbnb owners so that local operators, participants in the sharing economy can in fact become members of a DMO. And these were not traditionally thought of these stakeholders as, as necessarily, you know, member, DMO members. So is it is there a need to consider a hybrid form of organization for the DMO? And my third and final thought, um, if we could go to the next slide, please, has to do with sustainability and this notion of resilience. And I'm, I was so heartened to hear both uh, Pauline, Sheldon, and Eduardo uh, speak of this notion of the, the human side of innovation. Uh, because coming out of the pandemic, we, we heard a lot about resilience. And I know the term that is also being used is regenerative uh, tourism. Um, but we, we found that um, sustainability didn't save us, right? Um, maybe few things could have saved us. But the traditional ways in which we have measured innovation performance in a destination, primarily those metrics that relate to either improved revenues, lowered costs, competitive, uh, higher competitiveness or greater efficiencies, that the, the better, smarter, faster, measurable output that we have traditionally used in the past, do we need to move beyond 
uh, sustainable innovations to understanding, well, what would a resilient innovation look like? An innovation that is able to, 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 to support us as we move through an external shock such as the, as the, as the pandemic. And, and specifically here, uh, again, Pauline talked about positive and negative. And, and I, I mentioned here, could the pandemic have been a, an ecosystem rehearsal, kind of like a dress rehearsal for how we failed or how we won um, a significant external, a negative shock to the system. But more importantly, is it a wake up call for us to have rehearsals as a destination system on positive external shocks? In other words, the, the, the impact that technology is having and will continue to have on tourism destinations, how can we better prepare for those as an ecosystem? So in other words, as a destination system, as a complex system with many fluid actors, uh, fluid elements uh, that are changing in terms of role and title and, and priorities shifting, but can we rehearse for the next external shock that will come. Hopefully it will be, yes, a positive one and not a, a negative one. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say that just in closing, several of these thoughts are, are very high level conceptual ideas. And I know that it will take certainly the voices of many scholars over a lot of time to really detangle and, and, and make more, more concrete, more explicit these ideas. But certainly I hope that some of these thoughts that I uh, have, have shared will, will get us thinking and, and cause us to reflect in conjunction with the other presentations about the questions and the perspectives uh, that can prompt us towards a future research uh, in, in this space. Thank you so much, I'll end there. Thank you very much, uh, Pauline, and and the the sustainability and the resilience ideas that are coming with the human uh, innovation and also the transformative nature of tourism is 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 going to give us. Um, so let's go to our final speaker, and then we can have a conversation between uh, all colleagues and and explore new ideas and innovations that uh, they can help us uh, develop some of these things towards publications for tourism review. Okay, good. Um, so now our last speaker, Professor Brian King. Uh, Professor Brian King is head of the Department of Recreation, Park and Tourism Sciences at uh, Texas A&M University, USA. He previously held professorships at Hong Kong Polytechnic University and also at Victoria University, Australia where he also occupied university leadership positions, including department head and the pro vice chancellor. His research includes cultural aspect of tourism, hostility leadership, and destination management. He has authored books on tourism marketing and development, BFR travel, hostility leadership, resource and Asia Pacific tourism. He is founder and editor in chief of tourism, culture, and communication and has consulted to international agencies. He has industry experience as manager and or director in airlines, tour operations, destination management, cruise operations, and hotels. So please, Professor Brian King. Thank you, Daisy. Uh, thank you, uh, Dimitrios, and to Tourism Review for, for this opportunity. I'm gonna share a little anecdote which will show my age uh, I did my master's at Strathclyde University a long time ago, and Tourism Review was part of our set reading. And we each quarter, we'd get red one, a green one, a brown one. And this publication, Tourism Review, the authors published in their native language. So French, Italian, German, and English. And it was a conversation between people from different cultural backgrounds, uh, a scholarly conversation about the future. And think about 1946, Europe was just coming together after a very devastating war. It was a time for conversation, uh, creating new ideas about the future. And I must credit Dimitrios and the leadership team at Tourism Review. It's many years since 1946, but they've rethought, reconceptualized the journal. It's very global. And we don't have these other languages now, but I guess English reigns supreme in a way of, of scholarly language. And uh, it's making a big impact. Uh, so congratulations to, to Tourism Review and very happy to be part of this conversation. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I want to share the, the view of uh, COVID-19, start off with this as COVID-19 as in an inflection point uh, and think about where we can learn from history and previous inflection points. In the bottom middle, you see a slide from the Black Death of 1348, where a third of the European population perished, a very devastating uh, incident in human history, which caused a labor shortage. It meant the price of labor rose, and it was a stimulus to technological innovation because there were fewer workers around and people had to reconceptualize the future. The image on the right is the Great Resignation. And my a &M, Texas A&M colleague, Anthony Klotz, came up with this term, the Great Resignation, which describes how many people have left our industry through the pandemic. But the good news is, the, uh, certainly in the United States, the hospitality and tourism sector is accounting for a very big proportion of the new employment that's taking place. So that's the, the good news. Um, so I think that we can see that uh, there are things to be uh, learned from uh, history about how we're going to manage and research destinations. Can we have the next one, please? So I'm stating the obvious here. Some things through history stay the same and others change. So supply and demand, uh, whatever the circumstances, we will have to find a balance between supply and demand and address issues like over-tourism. But climate uh, change, the climate emergency, et cetera, that is something that is up and coming through our century and is something that we need to deal with. So I think as scholars, and uh, I'm in some ways addressing the new group of PhD scholars in the audience, we need to think carefully about what is big change or small change, what is incremental, and then what is more fundamental and what things uh, stay the, the same. So let's look at the next slide. Some of our assumptions uh, may be under threat. And I've just given a couple of e examples uh, that we might learn from history. We shouldn't assume global peace. Just think what the Ukraine uh, war has done to the idea of uh, mobilities across Europe. We cannot rule out the possibility of conflict arising, even though tourism is the peace industry. We cannot assume that so that our mass mobilities uh, will be around permanently. Will people be able to flow in a mass scale long haul to the other side of the world? Maybe not. We face recurring health threats. We've seen from COVID-19, it may not be the last. And then we say in the world of geopolitics, economic decoupling, uh, and we see maybe from China, this connection between tourism as an instrument of, follow, um, of foreign affairs and diplomacy. Will visitors be allowed to go to different places or will they be prevented from that? And the putting together of culture and tourism in the same ministry in China, is part of that uh, bit of uh, government control. And just the final point on this slide, showing that things goes in, go in waves. I think now we're really embracing the idea uh, of the authentic destination. We want this idea of the customized uh, individual, but think back some uh, decades when Conrad Hilson described each new hotel as a little America. So the idea of standardization, achieving particular levels, that homogenization globally, if you like, and it's discontent. So after COVID-19, I think we see a resurgence of the idea of the local, the authentic, the individual, but we cannot rule out that move towards standardization, which exists in the background as well. Next slide, please. Um, now this one, uh, I think the, 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 the words haven't come out, but the heading should be uh, livable cities in an urbanizing uh, planet. It hasn't quite come out. But uh, the points that I wanted to make about the top one is Vienna, one of the world's most livable cities, according to rankings. The, the cities are having to reconceptualize themselves. Think of Manhattan as a place where people commute to office blocks. It's all having to be rethought. But Nevertheless, post-pandemic, the world will continue to urbanize and our cities are very important for how we uh, rethink tourism. Uh, quality of life for residents, as, Pauli, uh, as the previous Pauline was mentioned, B 
becoming very important as we saw through the pandemic, people traveling locally and appreciating the local environment. The other bit missing here was this embrace of the holistic, people-centered design and ambient quality. So trying to move away from what you see in uh, Venice in the lower picture. And then finally, a celebration of multi-sensory environments. So vacation scape, which Claire Gunn conceptualized here at AM, foodscapes, even smellscapes. So this idea of holistic, uh, bringing the things together at the individual or the wider destination uh, level. Let's to the next slide, please. Uh, coming towards the end, uh, and knowing that we've got uh, students in the audience, I wanted to talk about implications for uh, researchers and also for uh, our um, methods. So we know that there was a profusion of outputs during the uh, pandemic. I don't think that can continue. We need to uh, separate the wheat from the chaff and focus very much on quality outputs instead of uh, quantity. We need holistic uh, solutions which require collaborations with experts in design or in technology or in AI, et cetera. We need multidisciplinary, networked and multisensory. I think Pauline made this point very strongly about DMOs. We need to, and we had to do this through the pandemic in education and destinations, rethink the face-to-face, -face, the hybrid and the virtual. We need all of these and our thinking needs to embrace that. And I think that we also are having to reconceptualize tourism as um, a catalyst for community development and show the value of tourism, mobilities, and our discipline uh, to the wider community. I think the next one may be my final. Um, now also missing the, uh, missing the words, apologies about this. This was about uh, methods. So I've said that change continues to proliferate and that creates wicked problems and we need to find solutions. We need interdisciplinary scholarly uh, collaborations. We need multi-sensory, which is the kind of experimental part. And we know that with big data, we need information intensity. The example on the right is from Hong Kong, where the historic environment has disappeared in many cases, but Hong Kong Tourism Board is using uh, augmented reality to bring back that experience, so technology. And uh, Daisy, if we could have the final slide, please. Uh, so just some uh, bigger questions for destination uh, leaders. Yes, we have planetary wide issues, global warming, food security, et cetera. Uh, big questions. Will we see a resumption of mass long haul travel or somewhat staying closer to home or both of these? I think in the issue of uh, energy and the global warming, the idea of what constitutes a beautiful landscape, but then uh, wind turbines, uh, nuclear facilities, etc. that area needs to be better understood. And I think maybe the essence for our whole discipline and its contribution to scholarship, the human machine interface in tourism service delivery. In hospitality in particular, we really think of things as being human centric and it's about passion and human to human but we know that AI is going to uh, not hopefully take away the human for, from us, but we need, really need to understand the, bird, the, the, the boundaries between uh, the two things. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian. Uh, what a finale. Uh, and um, um, really a very interesting uh, perspective of bringing uh, standardization and authenticity at the same time as a spe on, on the spectrum and also bringing the 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 new um, range of strategies that they'll see us going to the um, uh, to, to, to to bring tourism on the on the forefront and allow us to address the big the big questions through um, multidisciplinarity and by bringing different perspectives together. Okay, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, wonderful contribution. I think there's a lot of food for thought. Um...